United States aircraft carrier Hornet, part of a task force steaming into Japanese waters, is now revealed as the secret base from which American planes first bombed Tokyo. Here is that secret airfield. 16 B-25s, twin-motored army bombers, lashed to the Hornet's flight deck. The dramatic saga of a combined Army-Navy mission that brought panic to Japan and stirred the world for its brilliance and daring. For months, they've trained secretly. Now for the test. Doolittle's plane is first down the runway, the commander leading the flight. As the carrier plows through heavy seas, one bomber after another soars from the flight deck, pointed for Japan. In 1942, the U.S. Army Air Forces launched the Doolittle Raid, one of the most daring and audacious military missions of the 20th century. The mission would see Colonel Doolittle being awarded the Medal of Honor and placed the lowly B-25 in the history as one of the greatest airplanes ever built. The raid would see the first strike of the Japanese homeland in nearly a millennium, and its effect on the morale of both sides was tremendous. Today, with the expense of designing new airframes, what if we were to take this old medium bomber and upgrade it with modern avionics, weapons, and manufacturing techniques? What would that airplane look like? What would its upgraded performance be? And maybe most importantly, what mission and role could it fill? Well, thanks to Flyout, a sandbox flight simulator, we can actually try this out. Introducing the U-25 Doolittle. The U-25 is a twin-engine turboprop aircraft designed for persistent surveillance and counterinsurgency missions. It's powered by two PT-6 turboprop engines, and the PT-6 here is simulated and modeled to match the performance of PGATCOM's excellent video on the subject. It contains a crew of three, two pilots, and a weapons officer. And with a length of 63 feet and a wingspan of 78 feet 8 inches, it's about 10 feet in both directions bigger than the original B-25. With a service ceiling of 25,000 feet, it's about 5,000 feet lower than the comparable U-28. Standard day sea level max weight rotation speed is 165 knots, endurance cruise is 190 knots, which is about 40 knots lower than the original B-25, which was 230 knots. V-Ref for landing speed is 130 knots, with an endurance of 4 hours 45 minutes and a range of 1,315 nautical miles. And for armament, instead of an interior bomb bay, it has two hardpoints, capable of three weapons each, with an AGM 114 Hellfire or a GBU 10, 12, or 24 laser guided bomb. In the center line, it carries an AN ALQ 28 lightning pod and an IRST pod under the nose. For countermeasures, two radar warning receivers and two flare and chaff dispensers. But probably the most important question is well, how does it fly? Let's find out. B1. Rotate. Positive break, gear up. And you'll be 9 2 8 checking in, level 1 2000. Level 1 Give it a tally, single technical. And we are weapons free, cleared hot. Rifle. Rifle.
Tower, Jimmy 928 with information alpha, request visual trading runway 33. Ground, Jimmy 928, extend golf, uh, taxi to the hangar. So after flying it around, I've got to say that the airplane actually flies pretty well. It flies like a turboprop. It feels like a King Air, which is a testament not just to the design, but also to the flyout software that its physics model is able to handle this kind of an airplane and make it feel and operate in a way that feels familiar to someone like me who's actually flown airplanes like this. But probably this thing struggles from the fact that while it's a cool and an interesting thought experiment, it remains a solution in search of a problem. Sure, it feels like a good idea, but at the end of the day, this isn't really necessary, despite it being a great airframe. You see, here's the thing. With modern technology and modern engines, we've been able to build better airplanes. For example, the United States Air Force today operates the U-28, which is a Pilatus PC-12 variant. And it has a very similar role to the one I've assigned it here, which is the counterinsurgency and surveillance mission. It already carries a number of sensors, and while it doesn't carry any weapons aboard, it's actually able to fly at a higher altitude than the airplane we just did. It has a surface ceiling of 30,000 feet, like I said earlier. And this notional U-25 is only 25,000. Meanwhile, the MQ-9 Reaper has a surface ceiling of 40,000 feet. And in addition, it's unmanned, which means that you can put it into harm's way, and it can stay aloft a lot longer than either of the two airplanes that we just talked about. So, at the end of the day, it's not filling a role that isn't already filled. Sure, you could make the argument that it's a single airplane filling the role of two, but an MQ-9 is so much cheaper to operate compared to the other two that there's no reason to really do it. So, what if we were to change it and say, let's not do a military mission, but what about a civilian mission? What if we decided instead to put it into some sort of like a cargo service? Because you see, here's the thing. It's actually pretty well equipped to be a cargo airplane. It's got the H-tail for stability, it's got a high useful load already, it's got a workable service ceiling, and if you just add a ramp to the back and the front, you can actually convert it pretty easily. Positive break. Gear up. Plus 20, flaps up after takeoff checklist. So what do you think? Does an airframe like the B-25 have a place in the modern world if we upgrade it? Does the magic of those original designs still have a role to play in today's aviation industry? Or is it best to just let the past stay there? Admire it, venerate it, appreciate it for what it was, of course, but let it remain firmly in the era to which it belongs. Put your thoughts in the comments section, and while you're at it, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.